can uh, watch this afterwards. And also, um, I am just going to get this up right now, but we are going to have a little thing that pops up in the corner and it is going to say live and it's our um, transcription service and it's called Otter AI and it's just starting to go up and you just need to click it up in the corner and hit that and we'll open up another page and so you'll see a transcription live as we're talking. It won't get all the words right but it gets a pretty good majority and is actually pretty good with accents too which is amazing so we love the Otter AI service. Um, please look that up and we are now live and recording so welcome everybody. Um, my name is Hannah Cree and I am the CEO of Venture in Residence. I am a venture in Canada from 2018 and uh, have had the pleasure of working with Shio um, as I move through the craziness of COVID and having to pivot my own model and getting support by this radically generous network of women at Shio. So we have activators on the call. We have ventures on the call. We have guests that have maybe never experienced CEO before. And um, it's really incredible to have uh, Dia with us because she is an activator. She is on these calls and she does the most powerful ass that I've ever seen. And this is what she does. She lives and breathes this. First, before we um, jump in, I think it's really important and especially with CEO that we do land acknowledgements. Um, and for me, I'm going to do it from where I'm located today. Dia is actually in the US. I'm in Canada. And uh, I've just moved back to Calgary. And so some of these names I'm still going to stumble upon, although I've been practicing all week as I um, get used to the land in which I'm living in. And so situated in Turtle Island, which is Canada on Treaty 7 land. And in the spirit of reconciliation, I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot, uh, First Nation tribes, the Sisiskaka, the Pekani, the Gaina, and the Stony Nakoda First Nations tribes of Chickeny, Bearspaw, Wesley, and the Sutina First Nation. And the city of Cal Calgary is also homeland to the historic Northwest Métis and to the Métis Nation of Alberta and Region 3. I find this actually really interesting. I was through the process of the original land acknowledgement where that land acknowledgement actually only held about three or four different uh, tribes. And there was a lot of information that happened within Calgary saying, we're not recognizing everybody that lives on this land. And although there's a treaty, um, we were not recognizing our indigenous people properly. And so I'm very happy that we've been able to evolve that um, and do that and recognize the land in which we do business on. So thank you for that. Um, the learning circles, I want to say, are offered free right now during COVID, and that's because of the generous support of Government of Canada, and they've given um, CEO some more uh, operating so that we can provide all of this free education um, to whomever all over the world. And uh, I think that's a quite incredible thing that we're able to do during COVID. So now I'm going to just hand it over to Dia, the amazing facilitator. She was an auctioneer. I just watched a video. I was like, mind blown. And uh, I remember my very first conversation with Dia and I was like on fire and ready to change the world just from one conversation. So Dia, over to you. Great, so let me share my screen. Oops, start sharing screen, we'll stop others' computer sound sharing. Do you wanna continue? I do want to continue. Thanks everybody for your patience while I get myself operational, operational here. Um, make sure I can see the chat as well. So there, there I am live in chat. Everybody, we, as I go through the content today, chat is where we're going to be with one another is the place where we get to have a shared experience. So while chat goes by really, really fast, I am going to, um, I am going to be in there glancing at it as, fa as often as I possibly can. So that's where that can be. Um, I also let me put this in presentation mode here. See if I can bring the chat over top of that. Here we go. That looks great. Okay, and before I get started, two things. All of the stuff that you hear, all the content that you hear today is content that is going to be like, uh, is going to be blown out in a podcast that I'm launching in 2021 called the Dia Bondi Show, a big podcast for women with goals. So I'm just going to plug it right now because I'm going to get into this content and I'm going to forget to say it later. So if what I'm throwing down is something you want more of, the best thing for you to do is to, if you're in the US, grab your cell phone and text the word impact to 66866 and you'll be on my mailing list. And when the 
first 10 episodes drop. We're going to go live with a group of episodes. Um, you're going to get that in your inbox, or you can just go to diabondi.com. Um, Hannah just put that into the chat. I'll, we'll, we'll dump it in there a little bit later. I know. Thank you, Nancy. I'm super excited and nervous about the podcast. Oh, um, it's not going to work without women like you uh, telling us what works and what doesn't and what you want to hear more of. So I want to invite you into that. Um, I also want to say like, oh my God, COVID sucks. This last year has been, this is nuts. It's nuts. And you know, so much of our time, also you're going to hear the train come through right next to my office. I swear it's not actually crashing into my office. Um, I'm coming to you live from Berkeley and my office is right next to like five tracks. So you might hear that a couple of times over the time we're together. COVID has been brutal and it's really easy for us to be sort of on defense and offense at the same time and trying to like soothe ourselves and self-care and not, you know, ask too much of ourselves and others in the meantime while things are, you know, feel so constrained. And I just want to invite everyone in for the next time we're going to have together to just like, we're going to let ourselves dream a little bit. We're going to let ourselves be a little aspirational. We're going to sort of indulge in our own, in dreaming about our own goals and how we might resource them. So I just want to invite us all to play in a really aspirational space. And that's going to be fun for you and for me. Um, I move pretty quickly. I'll do my best to, uh, to grab your questions that come in. I will stop and ask for questions in the chat, maybe here and there, so that I know that we can drive our attention over there. I also want to share with you that the ideas I'm sharing with you today actually were born in the CEO community. Um, MJ Ryan, who's one of our uh, venture guides, was the first person I ever whispered these goofy ideas to. I was like, hey, MJ, I got this weird idea. What do you think? And she gave me a thumbs up. She said, you know, that's got some heat to it. And actually at our summit, our activator summit that happened just a couple of months later is the first time I ever spoke the idea out loud to a group of people. And um, after that, after I had women in the room say, yes, pursue that, it has really taken on fire, created a new mission for me. And I'm just thrilled to share back into the community, both activators and guests right now, something that was really born here. So there we go. You guys ready to get ready? You ready to get ready? You ready to go? Um, so here we go. Yeah, Melanie says she loves someone who talks as fast as she does. Yes, this is going to be a challenge for Otter. Let's just say that. So um, welcome to Your Most Powerful Ask. This is about how we can make the asks that can change everything for all of us and for everything for you. So my goal, I do have a goal right now, which is to help 1 million women ask for more and get it and use asking as a success strategies in their lives and in their careers and communities. And really that goal is something that, you know, these ideas, um, created for me. And after I worked on this goal for a while, I, I was asking myself, but why Dia? Why do I want women to ask for more and get it and use asking as a success strategy? And really, I see now that my mission behind this work is to put more money and decision-making power in the hands of women so we can change everything for all of us. And you're going to see what I mean by, um, by not just, you know, when I, when I thought of these ideas in the beginning, I thought they would just be around money negotiation. And it turns out we can ask for so many things that help resource our dreams. It all started with this wild idea called ask like an auctioneer. And from that, um, from a lot of stages I've been delivering this content on and workshops inside and outside of organizations, I've learned that the women are who I'm really interested in and, and these, these million women, yes, change everything for all of us, April, that's right. Um, these women are women like you, high potential talent that are, you know, that really have big goals, women looking for visibility, mentorship, sponsorship, career growth, impact, investment, you know, anything they need to ask for to help them level up. You are entrepreneurs as business owners who are ready to reach higher. And for sure, you are independent. So many of you are independent professionals ready to really, um, Ask for bigger and better fees and bigger and better projects that actually bring your own vision for yourself and the things you want to impact to fruition. Since I launched Project Ask Like an Auctioneer in mid-2018, I've, I've talked to hundreds of women, and it turns out, and I've worked up, workshopped thousands of asks with them, 
it turns out that I can, I noticed that the things that we can ask for always fall into the four categories at the top of this list and the bonus category of fun, more money. And that can be anywhere from investment to getting a raise, a better comp package to raising your rates as a freelancer. It's about authority. And this isn't just about getting that promotion. So your name is an authority. It can be about owning decisions about things that are critical in your job and your career. It could, for many women, it's about stepping out on their own and being the author of their day. So they also follow, fall into the world of influence. What audiences, stages, mentors can they, um, can they connect with and ask for more of in order to help reach their goals and balance. And I don't just mean work-life balance. In a lot of cases, it turns out the asks we can make may help bring into balance our inner selves and our outer context so that the way we're living and what we're doing are more in alignment with who we are. And then under all of this, I've seen a lot of it is about more fun. Women are, women are making the asks, uh, the, um, women are making the asks that are helping them have more fun and joy in their lives. So when I say ask for more and get it, these are the kinds of categories that those asks can fall into, not just financial negotiations. So the question for you today to get the most out of the session we have together is this question. What is the one midterm and concrete goal you have in your career or business right now? now something right there that feels you know not like a big hairy audacious goal that is untouchable and out in the horizon and constantly moves away from you but something really concrete so my goal is to reach a million women with this content that feels like i can measure that and it does feel midterm even though a million feels like a lot so i want you to just hold in your heart right now maybe write it down or Text it to yourself. What is one midterm concrete goal that um, that you uh, that you have in your business or career right now? Um, I see here. Thanks. I, I do have a lot of energy. It is true. And I heard somebody in the chat saying uh, that you're a giver. And this is um, this is. This is so true. I've heard a lot of, I'm not sure exactly, April, what you're pointing to here, but I have a lot of women say they're great, they, they love to give and they hate to ask. And I'm here to actually balance that out because unless you, lots of women and lots of other people in your communities have a lot to give you as well. So my hope today is that you'll get one idea that gives you the courage and confidence you need to ask for more when you make the kinds of asks that really matter to those goals. So that's the idea. one idea if you get out of this time that makes gives you more, that is courage making for you. This is going to feel like a major win for you. So here's our journey together today. We're going to talk about how to ask like an auctioneer. I'm actually going to show you what that looks like. We're going to talk about three steps to finding the asks that matter because I have, I, I, it comes up a lot that women go, yeah, like I see how asking can matter, but I don't have anything. What do I ask for? I don't have an upcoming negotiation. So I'm going to show you how to kind of unearth the invisible asks you could make that advance your goals. And then lastly, I'm going to address a question I get a lot, which is, okay, I have the ask, but how the heck do I do it? How do I set up my ask so it helps me win? And then we're going to open it up. We're going to put you into some groups, um, some uh, small groups for you to, to work on the three steps of developing an ask with another woman who is in the session today. And then we're going to open it up and I am going to let you raise your hand and say, I'd like you to uh, workshop one of my asks with me, Dia. And we'll do sort of an open strategy session for everyone to hear. So that's what, how our time is going to go together today. So first, ask like an auctioneer. Are you, uh, are you all ready to hear what it means to ask like an auctioneer? It's such a wild idea. Somebody said, you know, oh, I love this concept and I love great marketing, Dia. How to ask like an auctioneer, really good marketing. And all I can say is, this is not marketing, this is actually the idea. <laughs> so here we go. I'm gonna start um, by sharing, uh, I wanna start by sharing this meme that you may have seen floating around the interwebs. I love this one. Let me move my stool a little bit here so I have more room because I know I'm gonna get excited. Um, I love this one because it really helps me have a strong sense of spaciousness. It helps me stand up when the world is tempting me to sort of shrink a little bit. And it reminds me so much of, uh, of how to anchor in my own voice and to not shrink when it's too tempting to. And it goes like this. You will be too much for some people. Maybe some of you can finish the second half of this. Those are not your people. You will be too much for some people. 
Those are not your people. If folks can't see what you're throwing down, it doesn't mean because you're throwing down the wrong thing. It's because you probably have the wrong audience. So when I see this for myself, when I send a proposal out to a potential client and they say, this is too expensive, I can know that I don't have to make my, I don't have to lower my price. I have to say, oh, I'm so sorry. You're not my people and move on and hold on to the biggest version of myself. So I, I, I want that to be sort of the context that we're, um, that we're using for what we're talking about today. I love it. Karen says, I'm too much for so many people. Get it, Karen. That's great. So who the heck am I? So my name is Dia Bondi. I am a longtime leadership communications coach and creator of Project Ask Like an Auctioneer. I have been um, a, a communications catalyst for leaders across the globe for the last 20 years. I spent the first 10 years teaching what you think of as a traditional presentation skills class in both technology and packaged foods. And um, the last 10 years is really focused working one-on-one -on -one with individual leaders and entrepreneurs so that they can find the courage to speak from the heart when they step in front of the audiences that can really matter to aligning um, every the world toward their business aspirations. I've worked, in fact, had the great opportunity to work with a bunch of our ventures. I hope some of you are on the call. And I, um, I that really is what my, that coaching world is all about. Um, and I've had the chance to be, I've, I've done a lot of stuff. Let's just say I probably executed 6,000 coaching sessions, taught hundreds of workshops around the world and got to be in the back rooms of some really incredible um, uh, rehearsal rooms, green rooms for some really incredible events with some really incredible voices. And we all suffer the same thing. We all suffer, uh, suffer worried that we're going to do it wrong when people are looking and listening. A handful of years ago, I took myself on, put myself on a, a sabbatical, sort of a working sabbatical, and I did the thing I had threatened to do 10 years earlier. My husband reminded me this was something on my bucket list, and I went to auctioneering school. I packed my bags and flew from California to the Midwest and did a 10-day training in how to auctioneer everything from livestock to art to real estate. It was me and 100 cowboys and like four other women at a hotel on the side of Route 66 learning how to do just that. And when I was done, I thought, that is so, you know, that was really fun. What am I going to do with this? And... Um, I thought, you know what I'm going to do with this? When I get back to San Francisco, I am going to be, uh, as an impact hobby, I am going to be the auctioneer in the Bay Area who does uh, fundraising auctioneering for women-led nonprofits and nonprofits that benefit women and girls. And that's just what I did, working with organizations like um, Dress for Success, amazing organizations, Bay Cat, which deals with racial equity, not necessarily directly for women and girls, but racial equity across the board and storytelling, Girls Inc., and a few art institutions around here that are women led and are female focused. So these two worlds crashed together for me after the first year of doing um, auctioneering. I did maybe 10 or 12 auctions and I realized something super powerful that applies to my communications work. Because here's the thing, clients come to me and they say, Dia, I need you to help me write my 12 minutes on stage. I need help putting together my story for clients or customers or partners or pitches. I have a, an industry event coming up and I need to get ready. I need to, what do I say? What's the story I'm going to tell? And inevitably, the question I have to ask them is, what are you asking for? You know, in business, we call that your call to action, right? What are you actually looking to get from the audience in order to move the thing that you need to move forward? And um, yes, Eve, it's an impact hobby. <laughs> yeah, looking for one that pays. That's a, that's a trick right there. Um, so I, I have to ask all the time, what are you asking for? And they'll tell me what they're asking for. It'll be headcount or investment or uh, mentorship or recruiting somebody for a board or... They'll be pitching a, st a strategic project for a consulting work or so they're looking for budget or whatever the thing is. I'll say, yes, great. But how much of that are you looking for? How many heads for, to resource this super important project at work? How much investment? How much time uh, mentoring hours are you looking for from the person you're talking to or the people you're talking to? How much? Because the quantity has a lot to say about what the level of resistance might be in the room. And this question of like, so great, how much, rarely gets an answer. Instead, what it does is it creates a whole bunch of hand wringing. Well, I don't know, Dia. 
how about, I really need like 12 heads, but, but there's no way they'll go for that. So how about I ask for 10 and then I borrow two part-timers from engineering and then maybe I can also get some contract dollars to hire a freelancer to help come in on a contract basis. Well, I really need, I really am looking for $27,000 in a partnership commitment, but there's no way they'll go for that. So how about 10? I don't know. Let me Google something. Let me ask my dad who knows nothing about my business. Let me ask my friends. Let me see. And so what we do is we start running around the world trying to figure out what the right answer is. And inevitably, I end up getting a question back to me, and it sounds like this. Well, Dia, shoot, what do you think I can get? And for years, I was like, yeah, great question. What do you think you can get? And we would game that out. We would ask in order to get a yes. We would shape our ask based on what we thought was possible. They'll never go for 10 heads, so we're going to ask for seven, and then we're going to borrow from engineering and see if we can make it work. So I have a mental model in my mind about the relationship between asking and courage because it takes courage to ask for things. It takes courage for ask, to ask for things. So here's how I think about it. On the horizontal axis, you've got courage. And on the vertical axis, you've got an ask. And you need a certain amount of courage to make a certain amount of ask, right? A certain quantity of the ask you're making. And that might land you somewhere right about here, okay? This is like a kind of ask that says like, I'm pretty sure I can get this. I can get a yes to this. So I'm gonna, I, I think I can muster enough courage to ask it. I'm 95% sure they'll say yes. And so that's enough for me. That's how much, exactly how much courage I can muster. Or maybe I'm comfortable with like, if it's 87% guaranteed, then I can muster the courage to do it. But here's the thing. What about all these other increments that are outside of the nearly guaranteed yes? What's up there? And why don't we go there? Why, don't, why can't we muster the courage to ask for something that feels not guaranteed? And the answer is because all those amounts live in a place I call the zone of freaking out. They are not living in the place of the zone of guaranteed. They are in the zone of freaking out or what I like to call the ZOFO. You'll hear me say that a lot today. The ZOFO. People say, get out of your comfort zone. Get out of your comfort zone. And I ask, if I'm out of my comfort zone, then where am I? And you are in the zone of freaking out. Now, at the very top of the zone of freaking out, maximum amount of courage, maximum amount of ask, there is something, there is a dot out there. There is an amount out there that has a no attached to it, for sure. But if we're willing to go up and touch that no and then negotiate down, we may end up at a yes that is bigger than anything we could have, we could have gotten if we had only aimed what we thought we could get. So we have to actively aim for the no. And that is exactly what we do as auctioneers. And I didn't even see this until I started standing on stages, rapid fire negotiating and seeing how beneficial it is, how important it is that the no, that we touch the no in order to maximize the opportunity of every single ask. So we ask to get a no as auctioneers. Now, I have a demo of this playing out in actually a live auction. Would y'all like to see it? Let me know in chat. Let me know if this is something you actually want to see, right? Yes, you want to see that. I know you do, girls. I know you do. So here we go. I am going to share with you as a one-minute demo. Here's what's going on. So I do this auction every year for Kala Art Institute in um, uh with the Law Art Institute in Berkeley. We do a live um, auction. We do actually 140 items on the wall for a silent auction. And then at the, uh, at the end of the night, we take 10 of those items that we pre-selected out of the batch of art we're selling, and we do a live auction. We usually pick 10 or 11. This item, um, this piece of art that you're going to see me sell right here was like ninth out of the 11 items we had that night. Um, this is just a quick one, one minute demo. What I'd love for you to do is listen for, listen for what am I asking for? What does it sell for? And also what's going on in the room? Okay, everybody, I, I have the volume turned up on my side. So if you're listening to it in your ears, put your, put your finger on your, on your volume button so you either can turn it up or turn it down if you need to. Everybody ready? Here we go.
42, jump into 46, 42, 46, 42, 46, 46, 45, are you in at 45, sir? 42, 45, looking for 46, 46, looking for 47, 46, looking for 47 here, she's in at 46, looking $4,700 here, 47, looking for 48, 47, just looking for $4,800, 48, looking for 4,900, 49, looking for 5,000, 49, looking for 5,000, he's in at 49, he's got it at 40, 49, looking for $5,000 here, 49, looking for 5,000. He's in right now at $4,900. Are you in at five? Five, looking for 51. Five, looking for 51. Five, are you in at $5,100 here? She's got it at 5,000. Looking for 51, she's got it at $5,000. Looking for $5,100. Yes, who is she? Go ahead and look. $5,000, $5,100, are you out, sir? $5,000, all in right now, sold $5,000. You've got it. You're better not. Great. So the next thing I asked was your bidder number because I needed to call her bidder number so she knew that she could claim her piece of art. Now, here's the question for everybody listening. Yes, it is, Natalie. It's so much fun and it's hard. Let me say it is really hard. Not just tracking your numbers, but actually going for the next ask is actually a challenge. And the, I am in my Zofo when I am doing this work. Just understand that. So here's the thing I want you to do. Tell me, what did I sell that piece of art for? Put the number in the chat. What, how much did I sell it for in US dollars? Yes, five grand, you're totally right, five grand. What did I ask for? Yes, thank you everybody, 51. I could not sell it until I got a no because getting that no tells me I have maximized the potential of that ask. So I am looking all the time for that no. And that no is a beauty, it used to be scary for me, even in, my, even in my coaching practice, no was scary. And now I see it as like this great sign that, ooh, that no just told me I am at absolutely the ceiling and I can negotiate down at the increments that matter to me um, and, and find that perfect equilibrium between what somebody's going to say yes to and what I actually need and what I asked for. So um, yes, I could not sell it until I maximized that ask. So so here's the thing. I understand you are all not in a competitive bidding situation, unless obviously you're buying a house in a high demand area or something. Um, I was in my Zofo, Erica. Yes, I'm always in my Zofo when I take stages, always. <laughs> and when I'm asking on behalf of the nonprofits I'm fundraising for, I am also in my Zofo. I'm going to give you some examples of that in just a second. So um, Zofo is the zone of freaking out. And you can watch that on the replay as we go about. Thank you so much, Anna, for adding that back in. Um, the zone of freaking out is the opposite of your comfort zone. So the, the, um, the thing to understand here, let's see, where was I? I just got in the chat and now I got lost. It's like those moments when you walk and you look in the refrigerator and you go, wait, what am I looking for? That's what happens to me sometimes halfway through. So you're not in a competitive bidding situation that often, I'm sure, but you can still anticipate, what do I think, what do I think I'll get it? What do I think will actually trigger a no? And how far away from where, how far away is that number or thing, volume of something I'm gonna ask for, than the thing I would feel safe and safe around asking? What is that gap? So we always wanna be aiming for that no. And if you touch it and negotiate down, you know you've maximized the potential of that ask. 42, I jump into 46, to 42, 46. Stop that, sorry everybody. Okay, so what do we do in order to actually, oops, let me go back. What do we do in order to uh, step into our own, let me click back, I think I might have it after, there we go. Uh, how do we step into our zone of freaking out? How do we help ourselves make the asks that challenge what we think is possible? We've got to empower the ask. And how do we do that? Well, I'm going to share four of the nine ideas that I pull from the world of auctioneering to help you make the asks that are bigger, bolder, and challenge your assumptions about what somebody will or won't say yes to. You ready for those? So here we go. Number one, this one is probably my favorite and one that helps me push send when I send a proposal that feels a little bit too big for my britches, the kinds of proposals that have a number on them that feel a little bit uh, Zofo-ish for me. Here we go. People are irrational. I get a lot of pushback on that. People are like, no, they're not. We make data-driven decisions around here. And I'm like, fine, I get it. You might do that. But people, individuals are pretty irrational. If you don't like that, you can just say, your rationale is not their rationale for what they'll say yes 
or no to. So stop deciding for them based on your rationale. Let me give you an example. And I've seen this happen, and I know this because I've seen it play out in auctions over and over again. And the beauty of auctioneering is that it's so rapid fire, you see something instead of played out over months and months, you see things pl play out really explicitly right in front of your eyes. And I see this all the time. For example, last year, I sold a piece, uh, I sold a piece of art that had the street value of $10,000 for $4,500. Okay. People who were selling it, they thought it was worth 10 grand. Person who bought it thought it was worth 4,500. At the same time, I actually sold at another fundraiser, a two night camp, excuse me, a one night camping trip. Granted, it was a luxury camping trip for 12 people for $55,000 twice in one auction. Yeah. Hannah's like, excuse me? Yes, because let me just tell you, it was shocking to me because am I going to spend $55,000 on a one-night camping trip? Probably not, but my rationale is not their rationale. We started the bidding at like $12,000 expecting it would never go above twenty-two. dollars We sold it for fifty-five dollars twice, so we, found, we ended up with $110,000 for a two-night camping trip. Boom, stop deciding for, uh, for other people what they will or won't say yes to. That might give you the freedom to make a Zofo kind of ask. Second idea that helps you empower the ask into the zone of freaking out. This is this concept of knowing your reserve. This is something you know that you're not going to take less than in the counter offer. This is the number or the level of engagement or the partnership agreement or something that quantifies the thing that you're asking for that you won't go below in order for you to say yes to. This is the place where, yes, at that number or that level of engagement, they can't touch this. So know that and you're safe. I know this because when I go sell art, what I do Every time in prep for the in preparation for the auction, I have to know from the client what's the minimum you'll take for this piece of art. If I sell it for seven dollars, do I still sell it? I know you want ten thousand, but what if we don't get it? What's the minimum we'll take? And if I know they say forty five hundred, I'm good because I can. If I can't get it to forty five hundred, I can just pull it right out and say, "Oh, I'm so sorry. We just we're pulling it out. Pass." Actually, in auctioneering, what we do is we put a house paddle in the air and it just comes on out of the auction. Not this time, people, not at that price. We get to decide what our reserve is. So know your reserve and you're going to be in, you are going to give yourself courage. Why? Because people ask me this all the time. Okay, but if I, if I don't get what I'm asking for, if I don't even get my reserve, what do I do? And the answer is, I don't know. What are you going to do? If you know what you're going to do, if you get a no to even your reserve, that negotiation or that ask you're going into is not a deal killer because you, it is not the cul-de-sac of your dreams. It becomes one speed bump in the direction you're going to next. So you've got to get yourself, if you've got to get yourself a reserve, and then you've got to answer the question, if I don't even get my reserve, what are we going to do? And now that you might find that is a courage making activity for you. And it helps you make the asks that challenge what you think you can get. Okay. Um, so idea numero tres, here we go with idea number three. So here, um, so here, this one, I'm just looking at the chat really quick, perhaps good idea to move uh, to your reserve, but take something off the table. Sure, that could be an issue of increments, taking something off the table as you go from the no all the way down to your reserve. Absolutely, you can find what those mechanisms are as you craft for yourself, you know, what the, I'm going to say chips, but the, what, what kind of, what you can toggle as you go into a negotiation with somebody. So let's see, price is a measure of value, not your worth. Uh, okay, this one's a little tricky. <laughs> um, right now, in our in um, the, the sort of conversation is around get paid what you're worth, know what you're worth, and yes, I want you to get paid what you're worth to get the level of engagement and the partnerships that that are that are what you are worth. I yes, and this can be a little bit of a trap. I have heard a lot of women talk about, uh, I want to get paid what, we, what I'm worth. This is just in the money type of ask. And if they get a no to that, it can be soul crushing because is that a signal back to me that that's not what I'm worth? So I want to uncouple the idea of value and worth as two, 
two separate things because we are all, we all have worth and we are all worthy. It is our inherent worth. But what somebody else values to attach an amount of an ask to, we can't, we can't always control. So I, again, I see this in how things play out all the time in auctioneering where a client will say, we want this trip to Hawaii to sell for $12,000. And all I can say is I'll sell it for whatever, whatever someone values it in the room, as long as it's above the reserve. I can't control that for them, but I sure as hell can make the ask. So I have reframed this um, and to make it useful for me in my career and the asks that I make in my career to make to sound something that looks a little bit more like this. Oops. That price, or I think of what they'll pay, your audience, what they'll pay or do for you and with you, is not is a, a measure of value or a way to see what they value and how they value it. Not the way to measure or define our own worth or worthiness. So this, to me, touches back to you will be too much for some people. Those are not your people. So I hope this gives you another um, mental model to help you step into your Zofo and make the asks that matter. And if they can't see it, and, and you get to say, no, thank you. Let me continue. Let me continue here. Fourth idea that I pull from auctioneering to help me make bigger, bolder, more, more meaningful asks is this notion um, of being an agent for your purpose. And I want to start by saying in my communications coaching work, I've seen over and over again, a leader I work with can say the courageous thing if they really connect with the purpose of their time on stage and their own purpose in the role that they're playing as a leader or as a founder in their organization, their overarching why. And as auctioneers, what I learned was when we are auctioneering, we're actually, we're not the buyer and we're not the seller. We are an agent for the, per, I, I'm an agent for both. And in this way, because I do nonprofit fundraising for women-led nonprofits, nonprofits that benefit women and girls, what I'm doing here is I am being an agent for the purpose of the organization. And sometimes in my auctioneering role, I'm not actually even doing a negotiation. I'm just standing on stage and saying, we, here's what we're here to do in the world. I'm asking for direct pledges. Would anybody like to raise their paddle at $25,000? Anybody in for $25,000? Anybody in at $10,000? And I'm just, I'm just making cold asks for people to say yes. And when I get to the lowest amount and I have no more paddles in the air, I have a choice to ask one more time, which feels like a Zofo kind of ask, or I have, an or I have the chance to stay safe and just put my mic away and walk away. And a handful of times in the last year, I have said, Dia, the, the choice right now is to ask yet one more time and see if we can, on behalf of the purpose of this organization, find one more give in the room. So you can be an agent for your own purpose when the ask that you are, are making might feel a little bit intimidating. And I wanna give you an example of that right now. A friend of mine, Jane, um, she runs a nonprofit. She was, uh, she's full-time there now, but, but for many years, she stood up this nonprofit that provides, um, excuse me, yes, it's nonprofit. They did not go B Corp. Um, uh, she, she stood up this project to provide high potential, um, ambitious women in the world of social impact uh, world-class coaching at a low bono rate, okay? Started out as sort of like a side project she was doing and over time it grew and grew and grew and she's done, I don't know how many cohorts now, she does three or four cohorts a year and she's been doing it for 10 years now. A handful of years ago, Jane called me and said, uh, Dia, she was chief of staff at a large technology company and doing this, you know, in, in the cracks and crevices of her life. She said, I want to get away from my, from my everyday career and go full time into this gig over here with my, with my nonprofit. And to make it sustainable, we're going to do a partnership strategy. And I said, great. She goes, well, so how can I help you? She said, I need to get on the phone with you and, and I, I need to like figure out what my pitch is. We have a, a potential partner coming up. It was actually more of a sponsorship opportunity. I said, sure. So we got on, a phone, on the phone and I said, what's going on? She told me the story. And I said, Jane, tell me like, what is it? What are you asking for? And she said, what do you think I can get? And instead of doing what I used to do, which was like, yeah, great question. What do you think you can get? I asked her, what do you need 
to resource your dreams. And she said, I need $7,500 from this sponsorship. And all I could think of was like, really girl, 7,500 all, is that all? She goes, all right, it's actually 14,000. And I went, okay, does that actually put you on payroll? If you do, if you land that many sponsorships across, you know, this next year? And she said, no, 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 actually it won't pay for me. And I'm like, well, if your goal is to actually drop your day job and have, make this sustainable enough for you to put yourself on payroll to afford to nurture it, what's that number, Jane? She said, it's $25,000. I went, now we're on to something. Okay. And I asked her, is that a number you can ask for? She said, that number is squarely in my Zofo. And I thought, yes, <laughs> sure it is. But it's a true number. So help me understand what, what's blocking you. And she said, you know, I just, I, I, have, I have negotiated million dollar projects, multi-million dollar projects in my business, in my, in my career on behalf of my employer. But when I go to ask for myself, when it's me asking for something I'm working on, boy, that feels hard. I said, Jane, what are you going to do? Take that 22 grand and go make a deposit on a Lamborghini? If you wanted to, you could, but we all know that's not what you're doing. What you're doing is an enabling your dream that is tied to your purpose. Let's talk about that for a minute. So we told some stories a little bit about what really matters to her and what her nonprofit is designed to do and the kind of impact that she's having. And when she attached to that, I asked her, Jane, can you not walk into that ask being an agent for yourself, but instead being an agent for this purpose to bring this thing to life? And she said, yes, that gives me freedom to ask big and bold. A couple of weeks later, I called her. I said, Jane, how'd it go? She said, terrible. I said, in what way? She said, I made the ask. And I said, great. And what'd you ask for? She said, $37,000. I was like, okay, girl. She was challenging what she thought she could get in a super real way. And it turns out, actually, they said no, but they would have said no at any Her audience would have said no at any range. Why? Not because the number was wrong, but because they her ask made them realize they weren't prepared with their own sort of giving strategy around working with nonprofits and sponsorships it it reflected back to them that they didn't have a a why for what they would say yes to at any level and so what she learned was that she's going to do a better job going forward about who she's getting in a room with to ask so that they are more aligned before she even goes to make that ask. And I have to say, this is true for us in fundraising auctioneering. What do we do? We invite people who buy tickets to the, to the events that we, to the art shows where we sell that art. And that is a curated set of people who we know are vision and mission aligned. So she's get, she did a better job going forward, not spinning her wheels, asking the wrong people for the right thing. So here's the thing. Other things can happen when you go ahead and ask. Even if you don't get to what you're asking for, you learn something new that can help you make the kinds of asks that can change everything for everyone. So I want to share another, another quick story with you uh, for, um, about this woman I also want to call Lorena the Brave. Lorena the Brave was in the audience the very first time I ever shared these ideas. She was sort of part of my beta test. And she um, walked out the back door, never raised her hand, never introduced herself to me. But it turns out she uh, tweeted something at me a couple of weeks after we were in a room together. And she said, Dia, I just asked like an auctioneer and I feel like I'm going to puke. And I love, uh, I love this because I know that she knew that I knew exactly what she meant. And what she meant was I just asked like an auctioneer and I feel like I'm doing something courageous. I'm standing up for my dreams for myself and I'm asking for more so I can reach my goals faster. And in the, the year after this very first tweet that she sent to me, she stood in her Zofo over and over again, and she 2X'd her salary and 3X'd her title. And she is now, would you like to see a picture of Lorena the Brave? She is one of the loves of my life now and a big champion for this work because she's seen that the entire experience was eye-opening and empowering for her. And she now, Lorena the Brave, this is her, she runs all of HR and all of recruiting and operations for an augmented reality gaming company. Gaming, which is a, a space that has been historically hostile toward women and for women. And she, just by the sheer placement of her in that influential position as a Latina single mom in her early 40s, she is effectively changing everything for all of us. We don't need her to do anything except be her own badass self. So this is what I mean where I want to put more money and decision-making power in the hands of women so that we can change everything for all of us. So she didn't ask, you know, what am I worth? 
You know, I, I've talked to her a lot over this last 18 months. She never asked what am I worth? What she asked was, is this counter offer I'm getting worth it to me? Which is a beautiful, bold, sure question. Now, one ask can change everything. And I want to share really quickly. I'm almost getting done with my content. I know I'm just going and going. Um, one ask can change everything. And my ask that I made looking back, my husband reminded me of this. When I, when I look back over my life and career, the, the, the ask that changed everything for me wasn't more money. It wasn't even, um, it wasn't a, a title. It wasn't a job. It wasn't an investment. It was a really simple ask. And it was, will you teach me? And the person I asked this to said yes. And it changed my life forever and is actually a big piece of why I'm here today. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to stop and see if there are any questions in the chat I can address before we go into like, okay, yay, but I don't have an ask coming up. Like, what do I do if I don't have an ask coming up? I'm going to show you a little system that you can use, a three-step system to finding an ask, then uncovering, like if I'm going to use asking as a success strategy, what might I ask for? So if you have, um, if you have any questions, you can put those right in here. Yes, if you put the uh, letter Q before, that would be great. How do you apply this to the virtual environment we're in right now? Ah, uh, well... Look, this can show up in what you write to someone. It can show up in a phone call. It can, sh I mean, whether we're in a virtual environment or we're in an IRL, you know, non-COVID environment, you know, the asks or the asks and how and where you deliver them may be a little bit different. You just need to consider the constraints of that kind of, um, of that kind of, uh, of that context. So maybe you're needing to build some rapport with somebody and that happens over email and then it follows up with a call. I'm, I'm not sure if that's kind of the question you're asking for, but I think rapport building is really an important piece of making a courageous ask. However, I'm pitching my book right now with proposals and I'm making big, scary, Zofo-ish asks right into a submission form. <laughs> like IRL or not, like I'm having to find, I'm, I'm having to not pull punches even when it's a cold ask. Um, anybody else have a question here? Uh, great, Sarah, I hope that, I hope that helped you. Um, is asking people, people to f survey a big enough step uh, than asking for a pre-commitment or should, should I add right in the survey for the pre-commitment? I don't know, Diane, great question. We should workshop that um, when, when you guys get back from this little, from this little, um, from this little activity you're gonna do with one another. That's a great question. If that's the question you wanna workshop in the activity, you can do that. I think it's gonna depend on how warm is the audience. Like if, you, if you're gonna ask for pre-commitment and you get two out of 10, is that good for you? Is that what you want? And the bigger question is, are you actually preemptively lowballing yourself by not asking for it? You know? Am I preemptively lowballing myself? That is, the, that is the way to know whether the question, you know, whether the ask is, um, is something you should include or not include. So uh, I love it. People are always like, what is the zone of freaking out? Yes, it is the zoe It is the opposite of the comfort zone. And it is where all of the potential is. I can also think of it as the zone of potential. When we make asks that are bigger than we know, we'll get a guaranteed yes. Those most often live in the zone of freaking out, which is also where the, where the potential for those asks are. So um, great. I'd like to keep going and give you this little three-step methodology. Is everyone ready? Everyone ready? In this next section, you can take a screenshot of this little three-step process. You can you know, take a picture with your phone, whatever you need um, to, to see how this goes. So people ask me all the time, like, yes, I love all this, but how do I actually craft an ask? I don't have anything on deck right now that I feel like I could ask for. And again, I want you to ask for more when you know you have an upcoming ask, but I also want you to, to use asking as a success strategy because I think it is the most actively overlooked and actively avoided success strategy out there. So many of us on this call, we know we love to give, but we hate to ask. So here are the three steps in, in uncovering, in brainstorming, what might I ask for to help me get closer to my goals? And they go like this. I started this session by asking you, what is one midterm concrete goal that you have in your, uh, you know, on deck for you? For me, it is a concrete goal is that I want to reach 1 million women with this, uh, with this, um, well, that's really my, my, my big top goal to 1 million. But one of my big goals inside of that 
uh, reaching 1 million women with this content is writing a book. I got to write this book, right? I, it is because I know that will help me get to that number. So that's the first question you need to ask yourself. The second question you need to ask, people always say, well, if that's my goal, what do I ask for? No, 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 let's slow it down just a little bit. So let's slow it down. And um, what my, what you, the next question you wanna ask is, what is my next big move in that goal? So for me, if I know that I need to publish, I wanna publish my book, Ask Like an Auctioneer, my next big move, because I'm going the traditional publishing route, is I gotta get an agent. That is, uh, that is a, I gotta get an agent, okay? So that is the thing that will bring me closer to my goal. And then the third step is, what is the thing that I can ask for that is a Zofo version of that thing to action that move? So for me, uh, approaching an agent who feels out of my league is the Zofo-ish version of an ask or a pitch. So approaching an agent who maybe um, is at the beginning of her or his career looking for a big book of business, isn't that influential and can't maybe, doesn't have a, a track record, feels not out of my league, would be sort of the safe version of my ask of an agent. So these are the three steps that you're going to use to start to uncover what might I ask for. Now, you'll notice in here I say that you're, uh, that uh, you can be, that the ask in step um, in step three can be attached to a who or not. Meaning you can say like, what asks could I make? And then separately say, who might I make them of? Okay. Or you can say, I know specifically who I need to ask. And here is the ask I need to make. And here's the zofo version of it. Okay. So um, let's see. Or for some of you, I'm seeing in the chat your zopo, which is your zone of potential, I guess. Um, so when you when you craft the ask, don't worry about whether you have a person or not to ask it of, or an entity or not, or whether you're going to ask uh, you, who of who you're going to ask it of. So this is the three step process um, that you're going to spend five minutes with someone, five minutes each with someone else in a breakout room. Hannah is going to put you all in breakout rooms in twos, just in dyads, and you can workshop this with one another. You, if if you come out of that workshop and you only had the first two steps done, fine. But this will just give you a chance to kind of apply this a little and see what happens. Hannah, is that, are we ready to break out? Everyone ready to break out? Break out! We're, we're so ready to break out. I got everything in chat. Know that your chat, everyone, comes with you. I will also um, post any messages. If by chance, now give it like a second or two, um, you seem to get into a room that there's no one in because we're doing pairs. So sometimes, you know, your pair just kind of disappears for a second and hasn't come over. Just exit and come into the main room and we'll pop you in. Most will be twos. There might be a couple with threes in here. And when you see it uh, pop up on your screen, please just say accept. You'll have 10 minutes. I will send out little reminders and uh, make sure that you see that in chat. Here you go. All the rooms are open. And Dia, just don't press accept. Just ignore yours. Okay. There you go. We'll see you in a minute. Well, 10. No, I'm not doing that. But here's what I want to do. And I told the women in the room, I'm going to share these ideas with you. Your job is to tell me if they suck or if I should keep going. And that was a great way to do two things, which what you're doing, get like actual get awareness around what I'm trying to do. And secondly, to actually get feedback to drive into refining the content. Exactly. So what I'm, what I'm not clear on with you is which of those two things is more important? Because it's two. I want it to be one. I would say the ex having the experience. The, the experience, getting this in of, front of, of Yes, of, of participating in a workshop or a one-on-one -on -one session. Okay, great. So maybe that's the goal. I need 100 women to participate in either a one-on-one -on -one or a workshop. Exactly. So yes, so that, so I heard at the beginning, my goal is to get this in front of a hundred women, but that is hard to measure unless you're getting direct feedback. A more, the, the goal that feels more alive to me is, and welcome back everybody. We're just finishing a, a small breakout and then we're going to jump into like, we're, well, I guess we're already jumping into workshopping, but um, the, the, the goal that feels more concrete is like, I need a hundred women to go through something with me. 
That, I mean, that seems really abstract, but it's also concrete because you can be like, yep, I had 20 people in that workshop. I had seven people in that thing. I did seven one-on-ones this week. I did, you know, I, I did three focus groups. I did blah, blah, blah. So right. I'm going to encourage you to say my big goal is to, my big goal is to, to get a hundred women to go through something with me, a discovery call, a workshop, a, you know, a, um, a focus group. I'm just faking what the, what the things are. No, and then absolutely. maybe one, huh? Abs- I'm totally with you on that. Go and then one of the big moves that you might make is next, one of the big moves, one of the big moves I need to make to action that goal is to get, is to book two workshops with a minimum, but with a minimum of 12 women in them each. And then I would say an ask would be, who do I know that has, that has 150 women in their community that could recruit for me and be like a, you know, like a rec- recommender, like could fill my workshop for me? <laughs> and is that person, or, and is the ask you're making of that person uh, Zofo-ish? Could I have one or two people? Would you, would you drive one or two people to my workshop? Or is it, you know, can you get 25 women in your network to like join me. See what I'm saying there? Absolutely. Absolutely. And who, and, and I'd be like, and who's the scariest, most badass person with exactly the kind of women you want in your workshops and one-on-ones that you could go ask, you know, ask that of somebody who already, you know, is all your familiar and trusts you, but also that you're going to make a bold ask of. Yeah. The feedback just comes, which is great, but it's, it's, no, you need a hundred women to sit in your chair. Yeah, you need a hundred women to sit in your chair before February first or whatever. Okay. Yeah, I hope that's helpful. Welcome yeah. back, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, I uh, we what happened was y'all went into breakout rooms. A couple folks couldn't quite get into one because Zoom technology, um, and so we stayed here and and did the three step process with a couple of uh, a couple of opportunities. Lori and Karen both raised their hand and said, "Hey, let's let's workshop one." So we're about to do some more workshopping, but before we do, I want to share. Um, I want to share. Let me see. Am I still sharing my screen, everybody? I'm like so disoriented. I am still sharing my screen. So let me go forward. Yep. So um, before we go into this, one of the, once, once we have these conversations with a lot of the women I've, I've been working with this last year, um, which are come in workshops, keynotes, and I do sort of coaching circles, you know, every quarter that women who've seen this content can drop into just like we're about to do right now. Um, uh, ask me like, okay, I have the ask, but how do I say it? How do I say it? Um, and I want to share with you a little mental model that might help you. So, uh, you know, Lori, was that Lori I was just talking to also? Yeah. Yep. Right. Also, cause now that I'm 46, I cannot retain information for very long. So Lori, <laughs> so nice. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Um, so, so I want to share with you a, a little mental model that I use in auctioneering that might help you, auctioneering in so many other places, that might help give you a way to approach a courageous ask, sort of the story about it. And Lori, this one I would imagine would be super useful as you, you know, might approach other people in your industry who have existing communities and networks that would push women toward your experiences that you want to fill over the next, you know, over Q1. And it goes like this. Um, let me see, where am I? So uh, I understand that to make the ask, even if it's courageous, alignment really can be everything. Like it's, it's, the, it's a powerful starting point. And I use this framework I call, I see you, you see me, let's move together. So what that means is we're starting to set up our ask by saying, hey, I see you, I see what, I see what matters to you. So that that person knows that you're not knocking on an inappropriate door, meaning you're actually barking up the right tree, you know, that there's a reason that you're, that you're approaching them and that you, that you are speaking what you see them as, as a, a, a context for why they're coming, why you're coming to them. And then to share with them a little bit about you and, and, so that they can see you as the context for the ask that you're about to make where you might be making a move together. So in auctioneering, it looks like, uh, I'll step on stage and it'll look like, hello everyone, I see why you're here. 
dress, this image right here is from Dress for Success um, fundraiser we did last year. And I'm speaking the language of the community in that moment. I'm saying, I know why you're here because you value these things. I see all of the work you've done as a, co as a contributing community to Dress for Success and how successful they've been in this last year. I acknowledge that work and you know just the effort to even get here tonight. And I see exactly what kind of impact you're intending on having tonight. We're gonna do that. And then very quickly flip that to say, look, now let me, let me help you see me, why I'm here and what I'm really doing. My name's Dia Bondi. I'm a longtime leadership communications coach and my impact hobby is to stand on this stage before you. What I value is helping elevate women so we can put more uh, money and decision-making power in their hands so we can change everything for everyone. My work is this and other things and my mission is, and so that now we have an alignment that creates the platform for an ask that feels courageous for me to be making and delightful for them to be saying yes to. And it gives me sort of a foundation for making the bigger version of the ask I need to make. So um, as, you, as you think about the asks that we workshop today that you may go out and make in the world tomorrow, this might be a, a small mental model to help you figure out where do I even start? So when we say like, uh, I see you, you see me, let's move together, meaning I am, this ask helps you get more of what matters to you. This ask helps me get more of what matters to me. And when you say yes, you're helping us both. Because inside of every ask is an offer, an offer for someone to action their own values, an offer for them to stand up for what matters to them, an offer for them to feel valued, an offer for them to save the day, an offer for them to be a hero, an offer for them to practice radical generosity. And that's why it's not an, a mistake, I think, that our Ask app isn't just an Ask app, it's an Ask give app. And like I saw in the chat early on, you know, I am a giver. We are, so many of us are givers. And when we have the chance to give in a way that is real and courageous, um, it can, it can be a value to both sides of that coin. So I'll say that, like, I love this quote to say that, like, only when we are brave enough, only when we are brave enough to, uh, to, um, to explore the darkness will we discover the infinite power of our light. And from Brene Brown, I love this quote because it tells me, when I think of the darkness, I think of making the kinds of asks in and of the world that don't have a guarantee can feel like tripping through the dark. We don't know what we're going to get back. And when we do get something back that is more than we expected if we had preemptively lowballed ourselves, that is a delightful celebratory moment. So here's what I'd like to do right now. I'd like to remind you that yes, you will be too much for some people. Those may not be your people and that's okay. So I'm Dia Bondi and this, I said it to you earlier that you can text the word impact to 66866 uh, to get on my mailing list because all the stuff we're talking about today is going to get unpacked in my podcast, which I'm super excited and nervous. And my Zofo ask is to um, bring women <laughs> for, for you to be on tip for when that drops so that you can subscribe and share with friends um, because we're wanting it to have a lot, a lot of high impact content that women can actually use without having to buy anything. All right. So I'd like to now go open it up again to our, to our group. We have, we have about 12, 15 minutes, a little bit more, 18 minutes maybe a little less, sorry, uh, to, to workshop some of your upcoming asks. So if you'd like to talk about an upcoming ask or any questions about what we've covered today, you can do that by raising your hand and Hannah can call on you. It's just that if we have 60 people in a call and everyone jumps in at the same time, we, we won't be able to sort who goes first. So you can raise your hand and Hannah can find you. Yes, yeah, you Lisa can use Bragg. that with the, there Lisa you Bragg, go. you reach out to me, whoever Lisa Bragg is, award-winning podcaster. Yes, I need that. Oh, Lisa's amazing. Lisa's amazing. Um, so with the reactions at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you can clap or you can put a thumbs up. So if you want to chat, if you can do that, I can look at the participant list. This is your opportunity. Perfect. The first person I see is Frances Francesca. Great. Fra Francesca, where are you? I think if you start speaking. Just unmute. See you. Yeah. There we go. I'm going to stop sharing also so we can just be together. Hi. There. I, Perfect. I didn't realize was it actually me, but it's okay. <laughs> um, well, I have a little initiative, which is um, trying to build more healthy um, students 
who are attending community colleges. I was a community and, college student. Yay, community colleges. Yeah, I have experienced that too. And I've observed a few things. And there was this survey about, um, you know, diets and exercise. And it seems like from this survey, the students are willing to try. They know what healthy means. Um, so I did approach the health department and there was a very big enthusiasm from one person because they have data and they want to use data. It's just going through the process to use this data. But I also needed the support from other individuals within the same community. And I did and it felt a little bit less enthusiastic and there are many reasons. But I feel like I need to bring a community of leaders from the college on right. board. And it's like um, the technology. You mean, part, camp, I, you mean, I'm sorry, Francesca, you mean um, like campus staff? You need people yeah. on campus to champion the program so that they'll right. stand, yeah, so that it's more ubiquitous and it's not just you trying to push right. through a, right, okay. Uh -huh. um, but I do have uh, some sort of experience with the technology but not very much. So it's like, I need to get the technology person too, because this is all going to be technology based. It's sure, what's, what's the question? Um, so I, I have approached many, I've been given suggestions. So I just wanna go collectively and bring a meeting. I mean, I think it starts with meeting face to face all these people. And um, I wanted to build like a one page website just to create what is the vision of this and bring that community through this one page, bring it together, communicate, start okay. a conversation. Okay. Um, and then bring some technology experts too, as to how from the community itself, this is all going to be the community. Yep, the the community driven initiative. Okay, so what's yeah. the question? I, I have like another minute with you and then we're gonna go, we have a bunch of questions coming up. So um, what's, how can I help you? Is, is the website so important versus the, the leaders? How am I gonna kind of communicate? Is it the technology or is it those relationships with the leaders? I, I couldn't answer that. I'm not a technologist, but I would say that like the voice, the champion voices are where the asks can happen. So I would straight up say website or no website, business card or no business card. You know what the concept is. You know what the impact is you're trying to make that you could leverage. I see you. Hey, technologist on campus. I see all the work in community driven initiatives you've done over the last five years. You're, you are a fantastic community leader. And I know that you are also involved in a health and wellness panel that I saw you on last year and that you care about health and wellness. Here's what I'm doing and the impact I'm trying to have on the, on the health and wellness of you know, campus uh, participants here. And we need a technology champion like you to help bring to life this vision. Will you participate in this upcoming panel I'm hosting? Will you, will you sign on as an ambassador for the program? I mean, oh, okay. I don't know that that's dependent on a website or no website. Okay. Is that helpful? Yeah, the ambassadors. Yeah. The, those yeah, that's what I, right. yeah, I love that stuff. I think that you can, I think that in some ways, not having things fully developed, if it's community driven, yeah. you know, can, can be wonderful because then those folks can participate and be part of the growth of it and not just signing on to something that's already hardened, you know? Okay. okay. Thank you. What was it? Who, who's next, Hannah? Thank you for that. Thanks for that question. Uh, yes. So we have Nancy. Nancy. Where are you, Nancy? Hi, everybody. Yeah. I really resonated with your story about the champion um, and how she, she created a nonprofit to help others. Jane the champion, I, yes. She's awesome. I'm, sim I'm similar, except for I didn't go the nonprofit route, and I have sure. a nonprofit business. And so I, I help empower queer folks. I help with coming out coaching, things like that. And, and I found that a lot of people in that sphere don't have the money to pay for my services. And so I'm looking at another model of like trying to yeah, create. Yeah, and get somebody you know, else to pay for their services. Yeah. yeah like, come on, but, champions, let's go. Put yeah, your money yeah, where your mouth course. is. Yeah. Exactly. And so I, I worry, I guess, in my ass that I, I don't have a charitable donation number that, that they can get some a kickback for donating. But I... I still want to ask. And so How I about the impact is the kickback? Here's right. the thing is like, you know, sometimes, yeah, I mean, that's what CEO is. Like, 
The yeah. impact is the kickback. I mean, I wrote a check for 1100 bucks and the impact is what I'm, I'm after. And here's the thing, you will be, that model will be too much for some people. Those are not your people. So it, it is about seeking out like Jane the Champion's story. So, I'm sorry, Nancy, can I just rant about this for a second? Because like, like Jane the Champion's story, your job is to go make the biggest, boldest, most courageous ask of the people who are already aligned to what, to the kind of impact that you're trying to have in the world. And maybe their, you know, maybe their kickback isn't just, uh, maybe their kickback isn't, you know, uh, they get a tax write-off. In some ways, I'm like, why wouldn't you do this even if you didn't get a tax write-off? If you say that you are an ally or whatever, um, mm -hmm. I think that there's an opportunity for you to also generate reports or you know uh, deliver content into their organizations as part of their sort of sponsor member community. You know th there are other things that they, you might be able to get in terms of product as an outcome of this. But I I think you don't have to change your story or feel feel like like you have to apologize for not having a a, a, a charitable donation receipt when people write a check for it. So I don't know if that was your question, except to say that like, if that's holding you back from, from really going there, there might be a really beautiful, um, th the work of it is getting the right people in the room and to tell the story back to them of what they're already saying they want to, what kind of impact they want to have as an organization in the world and then show how what you're doing in the world is a way for them to deliver, deliver on that promise. Right. I don't know. Yeah, I think I'm still like unsure of who the right people in the room are. Like my first thought is rich gay men, <laughs> but I don't know as many like rich lesbians, which I work more with, with women identified people. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I any wonder, I wonder if, is there, are there a group of people that can, that can do a barn raising with you or a group of people you can get in a room with to brainstorm who might be the right profile to, to pursue? Yeah, that's a good idea. Who are they? Who are the six people who get what you're doing um, at whatever level, whether they're across the dinner table from you or, you know, are, you know, in communities you participate in online, like who are those six to 10 people that you can get to do a, an, an ideation session on what that profile might be. Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. That's an ask you could make tomorrow. Okay. Of your community. I need help. I, want, I need help pursuing this thing that we both care about and I'm stuck. Help unstick me. Yeah, awesome. Okay, who else is up? Uh, the Thanks next so much. Is... Yeah, it was awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, the next one is Jen. Jen, Jen where are you, Jen? I'm right the here. Hi, beautiful Dina. faces. Hi, Jen. Thank you so much. Um, so I own a co-working space in the Chicago suburbs. Um, I hope you're okay. I also have a barking dog. Right. <laughs> We're hanging in there. We're hanging. We have a, a very nice landlord, and we also got a nice grant from our county. Um, my awesome. dog is super excited about awesome. that. Sorry about that. But yeah. um, so my goal, honestly, I'd love to have like. 20, 30 spaces around the country. I focus on working parents. We're open to all, but my, we're mission driven to help working parents. Um, and I have a couple of different next big moves. One of them is internal and external. The internal move is I need to hire more people because right now it's just me and one other person and I'm not getting paid. And that's been fun, but you know, getting a paycheck would be even more fun. Uh, you think? Watch <laughs> and, out for that burnout monster. Yeah. Seriously. Overworked, underpaid mommies don't do so well. No. Um, so we're looking for some investment money to help bring out a third person, probably even a fourth or fifth on a contract basis as well. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and I have some folks with, with some pockets, but it's like, you know, how do you, how do you make that transition from, you know, hello acquaintance to please give me money. Um, huh. And then... So I'm going to interrupt you. And in coaching, okay. we don't call it interrupting. We call it intruding, which is just a okay. fancy pants way of saying interrupting. Um, I, what, I love, uh, what I love about what you're pointing to is it goes back to the same framework. How, how might I cold call somebody that I'm an acquaintance with who I know has pockets? Guess what? I see you. You see me. Let's do something together. Mm. Hey, Mike, over there at Investment Capital Yada Yah. I, I know you care about these things. I know these are in the ballpark of investments that you kind of make. Here's what we're doing. And even in the face of COVID, here's how successful we've been. I want to take them. Uh, and here's what I'm trying to do. The impact that I'm trying to have in the world 
is squarely aligned with already the kinds of investments and impact you say you want to make in the world. I watched all your YouTubes. I sat in on those panels. I, I read your newsletter. So don't try to pretend like you don't like this. And then let's get on it. Can, could we meet? And you might have to do that 500 times, but I see you, you see me, may at least unstick you a little bit from that blinking cursor. Mm. Okay. Yes. You did say that many times in this and I just needed to hear it for, for myself. Sure. I mean, if you're, and, and, and the next big move, you're going to have to tell the story obviously of where you are once you get the call, but the ICU starting with they, with what acknowledging what matters to them and where they are in their business as a platform for why it matters that they know what you're working on might set you up, give you again give you a place to start the conversation also what's beautiful about that is you're going to weed out the people who don't get it right away so you're not having a fight with somebody who's not listening mm. So amazing. Amazing. We Jen, thank you time. for the question. Dia, we're at time. I know that there's more people with their hands raised. This was amazing. I put the feedback form in there. I'm pretty sure you want to see Dia again. If you do, let us know. Maybe we can dive deeper on this. Maybe uh, put in, we love your energy, Dia. You know that it was all up in chat, um, ready to take on the world with the ask. I love how you reframe things um, for me too. This was really great. So we will send out a wrap up the video. There is actually a little template uh, worksheet that Dia is going to give you. So you can listen to this again and reach out to her. Um, thank you, Dia. You're amazing. Have an incredible day of wherever you are in the world. The beauty of Shia. Lots of claps and the emojis and reactions. And me thank a note. You. Hello at diabondi.com. I want to hear about your story. Send me all the things. Send all the things. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.